starting today on an all-new Dr. Phil. During my addiction to heroin, I overdosed in a car. I was found and brought to the hospital. I'm here because I want to dig into it. Well, you're barely here because you tried to leave already. I was addicted to heroin, that I was getting beat up, that I left my kids. What do you need to understand? Are y'all smoking and drinking together? No. Yes. Why is she saying yes and you're saying no? I don't smoke or drink. I'm the outsider watching them two connect. I'm not sure that you guys are ready to change. Be specific. Oh, I've been specific. I gave you a specific assignment that you just blew off. Is there anything that I say to you that you're not going to argue with? I'm going to argue what I feel is right. Is there confusion about biology in this family? Is this your biological father? I can leave and you can finish it with them. You do whatever you want. We're in the home stretch. I try. Of the hard time. I've never heard of my wife say Aria could be another man's daughter. That hit the nerve. When the bones are good, the rest don't matter. This family doesn't need a remodel. It needs a tear down and rebuild. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today's going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. Well, you can well imagine that I have seen countless stories involving addicts and their families right here on this stage. Many involving enabling, codependency, mooching, you name it, and we've dealt with it. But I've got to say, in all of my years, the family talking to me today has to be one of the most dysfunctional families that I've ever seen. For almost 11 years, Ariel has battled a heroin addiction that has brought out the worst in her and her loved ones. Her mother Donna claims she's given 100% in the fight to save her daughter from heroin. But if that's the truth, then why does the family call her the queen of enabling? Donna's husband Ivy says Ariel's addiction is above his pay grade, so he let Donna take the reins. But to me, it looks like she's running this family into the ground. Ariel's two teen siblings, Ellie and Michael, have been the collateral damage in the fight for Ariel and have been second-class citizens in their own family for way too long. This family doesn't need a remodel. It needs a tear down and rebuild. Take a look at what Ariel has to say. I struggled with addictive behavior since the age of 13. I tried to lose weight for sports in school. I was eating as much as I could and I was throwing it up. I ended up going to the dentist for my teeth because the back of my molars were getting damaged because of the food. And that's when everything started with the Vicodin. I was taking 10 Vicodins a day. By the age of 19, I was introduced to Roxy's, and then by the age of 21, I was addicted to heroin. I couldn't get up and tie my shoe without putting a needle in my arm. My light in my room was on at five o'clock every morning because I was putting a needle in my arm. By 5.30, I was bringing my father to work. He was giving me cash. He would stop by the ATM on the way to work and pull out money for me. Everyone knew I was getting high. I was doing it up to 10 times a day. My mother spoke to me a bunch of times about I know you're doing heroin, you're going to die. But she would turn around and enable me to get high. My mother would give me money when I needed it to go get high. Go into the bathroom and do what you have to do. I feel that my mother, in some ways, participated in my downfall of addiction. Well, Ariel's family have been through hell and back during her battle. And their list of grievances, well, it's a pretty long list. I have been criticized by everyone how I have dealt with Ariel's addiction. I am fighting for my child's life. And if 
that meant her sitting in the house nodding off, then that's what it was. She kept using the drugs. As we found a new needle, she'd go get another needle. We would collect them. Two times I ran to get my dad because I was afraid Ariel was on the bathroom floor dead. I can clearly remember walking into the bathroom and Ariel was laying on the floor naked. We would just put her in the bed and keep going. We loved it too much and we thought as parents we were handling it in a good way. During the past 10 years, my life has surrounded Ariel and her addiction. Donna put 100% in trying to help her daughter. She went above and beyond because our marriage suffered. Once I realized how bad Ariel's addiction was, I spent from sunup to sundown, chase the drug dealers down, go to social media, follow her. I will continue to pull off every message, every invite, every name that has contacted Ariel on this phone about drugs. It began to be a full-time job. I did not realize that my time spent on Ariel's situation was pulling more away from Michael and Ellie. My mom was helping me with my reading problems. Then she stopped because Ariel was on her drugs. I sacrificed the marriage, relationships with other family members. I am proof right here that sometimes you can't please everyone. Trying to help one, you may lose. Well, hello. 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 How's everybody? Great. We're good. Good. My first question, uh, and this is directed to all of you individually, is what's your level of commitment in being here? Because we can do one of two things. We can either kind of dust things off or we can dig down and really change this situation. Dr. Phil, we've dusted enough. We've been dusting, and that's the problem. We haven't dug deep enough. We haven't looked each other in the eye. We haven't said <clears throat> the words that need to be said to set us free so we can rebuild our family again. Even if that means hearing things you don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to hear for the last 10 years. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Ellie? I feel like we need to learn how to communicate with each other more, and we need mm -hmm. to learn how to actually understand what each other is saying. So you want to get real here. Yes. Because I want to be honest with you. I wouldn't have done this story if it wasn't for you two. Mm. Because I think you guys have been pushed aside and put in the back seat long enough. Michael, uh, your biological mother was how old when you were born? She was 12. She was 12. And what's your thinking, Ivy? Uh, this is a... This is a situation that, in my opinion, is clearly broken, is clearly not working, and it's going to take some real serious digging into this if we're going to really have a chance to change it. Mike and Ellie have seen a lot, and there are things that need to be said by them out of their mouths so, so we can hear them because we never heard them. You're the father of this clan. Yes. Uh, have you been active in the father role? Have you yes. abdicated or have you no. been passive? No, I've been 100% active because uh, when all this started, I tried to listen to everybody. Even when we were going through our deepest struggle, I was there for the kids, Michael and Ellie and the grandkids while Donna took care, um, trying to help RL. I never abandoned them and I would never abandon my kids nor mm -hmm. my family. And RL, how about you? What's your mindset going into this? My mindset is I want to move forward and not keep focusing on the past. I want them to forgive me. I want to move on with my life with my kids. I don't want to be known as the black sheep in the family that was on heroin for 10 years that ruined everyone's life. Mm hmm I see a lot of these things as not being in the past. Mm -hmm. Some are, some aren't. That's why I'm saying, are you interested in digging into what's going on here or yeah. not? I'm here because I want to dig into well, it. Well, you're barely here because you tried to leave already. Yes. And which is fine. If you, if you want to leave, you know, it's, it's okay with me. But if you're going to be here, you got to commit to being here because 
everybody here deserves a commitment from everybody else that you're going to commit and stay. So why did you want to leave? Because I got into an argument with my family, and I want to take this seriously, and I felt that everyone else wasn't at the time. And I was out of control. I had moments like that. You said you've given 100% to Ariel and, and her problems. Do you think that's been at the expense of the other members of this family? Absolutely. Been at the expense of my entire family, not just the children here. I have other children as well that I've lost relationships with. Yes, you do. And it seems to me that you've acted as though you only had one child. At times I did. At times I did act like that. At um, times, I was very disconnected. I was connected, but disconnected. I was there. And to me, I felt that I was doing the right thing because I was there. But there are times I missed. I missed a lot of things that, that I should have been aware of. Well, coming up, what does Ellie say was the most unfair thing that happened to her because of Ariel's addiction? We'll talk about that after the break. <laughs> The worst thing I ever saw was Ariel hit Michael with a cast iron skillet. Ariel trying to stab my dad, so I blocked it. She sliced my hand, and the cops came. She expects the family just to forgive her and move on, but it's going to take more work. Thursday. I truly believe that I had the perfect marriage with the perfect husband. Until U.S. Marshals held her at gunpoint and arrested her husband. They said he's being charged with four counts of child rape. I thought it was a mistake. I never knew he was a predator. I never knew that I was living with a child rapist. And now... Brittany, it's got to be disgusting to you that he's playing the victim. You don't want this to become part of who you are. That's Thursday. Then next Tuesday is his online marriage. Who married you? I don't know, a scam. I sent my driver's license, social security. They had me investigated. I'll bet they... Did. That's next Tuesday. When Michael was 15, his school had a sweetheart dance. He picked me to be his sweetheart. Before the dance, I got high on methamphetamine. During the dance, I left Michael, then I went out in the parking lot and I shot up dope. I was trying to find my sister. She came back all hyper. Everything was fine when I went inside. We danced, we had fun. We got out of the dance. I started to drive and I started nodding out. So I pulled over. She's like, you wanna drive? I was like, sure. Wish me good luck, I don't crash. At that point, Michael had never driven a car before. Now that I look back at the pictures, you can see my eyes are so big. You can see I'm not myself. Well, Ellie and Michael have been the collateral damage since the very beginning of their older sister's troubles, and they have the emotional and physical scars to prove it. The whole family dynamic changed when Ariel started doing drugs. Michael was fighting with my parents. My parents are fighting with Ariel. Everybody was fighting with everyone. The worst thing I ever saw was Ariel hit Michael with a cast iron skillet. The worst memory was my dad and Ariel arguing, then Ariel trying to stab my dad. So I blocked it. She sliced my hand, then the cops came. After everything went down with Ariel, mom had to step away to focus on her and Michael's reading suffered. 
When I was 14, Ariel had her baby Aiden. He had to stay in my room, which made my life difficult as a middle schooler. When Aiden got up in the middle of the night crying, I'm the one who had to get up with him. I was angry, annoyed, tired, because I wanted Ariel to be there to take care of her kid. My friends were dealing with typical 14-year-old problems and I was raising a child at home with my sister who was dealing with her heroin addiction. I learned to console myself without needing a shoulder to cry on. I became socially awkward. When all this went down, I felt like I wasn't really that important and that my problems weren't as important as Ariel's. Ariel isn't doing much to save the relationships that she's damaged. She expects the family just to forgive her and move on, but it's gonna take more work. I can move on from what happened, but I will never forget. Well, Ellie, you, got, you took on a job. Yes, I did. Instead of being a teenager, instead of being with friends, instead of developing, you had to mother a child. Yes, I, I had to help with Aiden when Ariel was not around um, and when my parents were busy like providing for the family, I had to step up and take the role. Were you aware of what was going on? Being aware and aware are two different things. Aware of Ellie helping, yes, but aware of some of the things that she suffered, no. I was detached. Half of my mind was spent on wondering where Ariel was or where I was gonna end up today when I got off work or before work. Yeah. And how about you? Were you plugged into this? I wasn't aware of that, that what she said, because when I got home from work, I was 100% there. So Aiden was my responsibility. I'm talking about your daughter. No, I wasn't aware of her, her that perspective that she felt, how she felt. I wasn't aware. By the time I got home, usually he worked during the day. By the time he got home, he picked up from where, you know, we left off. And by then, being that type of child, Ellie spent a lot of time, you know, withdrawing and in her room. It was like, my, my duty's over. My shift is over. Do you need me to do anything else with Aiden? You know, dad's home. But, I mean, did they ever sit down with you and say, tell me about you. How are you doing? How are you feeling? What's, you're taking on raising this child. Why do they never come talk to you about it? Um, I, because I don't think I really gave out that like aura that I was um, struggling. I decided to keep it to myself. So when th what they saw I, is what I wanted them to see. The effects of the neglect, I mean, I, I've kind of gone through and, and collected those things. I mean, at 14 years old, she's having to parent a, a, a baby and- But she wasn't really she, more or less parenting. Yeah. She did the feeding when I couldn't. She would, we never left Ellie to take care of Aiden. With, with that, she would be helping more or less me See, when, you, when I was overfilled. Did you hear what she said in I, the I heard exactly what she said. And exactly perception is reality. That's and right. that's a burden that she felt at the time. And invalidating it now, sitting here in front of her, doesn't help her. You said Ariel's been clean and sober for a year. Mm -hmm. You said it's been four or five weeks. Mm -hmm. This wasn't brought to my attention. I said eight to 10 months. Imagine my shock hearing this. We are back with a brand new season of my podcast, Fill in the Blank. With newlyweds and new parents, Jordan McGraw and Morgan Stewart McGraw. People at first are like, he's so quiet, she's so loud, how does that really work out? I'm the funnier of the two of them. That's, that's inaccurate. Were you guys nervous when the baby was born? Definitely not how I ever envisioned giving birth. Jordan, what do people not know about Morgan? Most people don't realize how gentle she can be. I'm going to cry? Are you crazy? A brand new season of Fill in the Blanks. You have a big announcement, right? Available on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. This isn't the first time that I've heard Ellie say some of the things. When I look at these... But you're telling her now that's not true. No, I'm not saying that's, that's not exactly true. That's exactly what she said. No, I'm said, saying no, that's no, what she said. No, no, she wasn't parenting. Said. She was feeding something. No, she wasn't parenting. She was not she parenting. She was never parenting. She, she never, never parented Aiden. She would feed Aiden. She may change Aiden. But to parent Aiden, that truly was left up to myself and to Ivy. Ariel, she did abandon that role. No dating, no normal high school years. You said you had to fight to get noticed. What did you mean when you said that? Like, I, when they were, weren't home, like with, or when they were home, I had to, you know, go up to them and 
try to pull them aside from what they were doing. Mm -hmm. You said you had to learn to console yourself. How did, how did you console yourself? Um, I'd console myself through reading books, listening to music, mm -hmm. um, sleeping sometimes. You say you hold grudges. Yes, I do. And you said you learned not to help others. Yes, help others, like, because it took a part of me that I already had little of. And you say, Ariel says, this is in the past, let's just move on. And you say it's not that easy. She hasn't worked at trying to build a relationship with you and make this, heal this relationship. I think I have. It's very difficult because we have to talk through it. And when we try to talk through it, we always end up arguing. Mm -hmm. You need more from her than you're getting. Yes, we need more understanding. What, what, what can I do? What can you understand? That I was addicted to heroin, that I was getting beat up, that I left my kids. What do you need to understand more from me? No, I to make you to understand me, me what, more. Because I, I understand you were going through very difficult times. But can you at least admit and say that I try to open up and talk to you? You guys are guarded against me as well. Yes. Okay. So it works mm -hmm. both ways. Listen to what she's saying. She missing, she, that's the real sister bond. I want the same and that's thing. And I believe that's what you're saying. She wants that deep sister, sister bond. That's well, it, you know, one of the things I'm trying to figure out, and this is what I meant when I said, you talk like some of this is in the past, so let's leave it in the past and move on. You, you said Ariel's been clean and sober for a year. Mm -hmm. You said it's been four or five weeks. Mm -hmm. At this point, I feel Ariel is clean, and I feel if Ariel would relapse, she would come and say, hey, mom, I'm having a problem. I think it's been over a year since Ariel has used heroin or any type of hard opiates that weren't prescribed for her. I do not trust Ariel to stay clean. Donna said Ariel was looking for her last night. I haven't put a needle in my arm in over a year. I have snorted heroin about five weeks ago. I am dealing with an active court case and the charges are pretty severe and it was hard on me and I got high when I left the courtroom. I see me snorting heroin not as a relapse, not as me going back to day one starting all over again. I look at addiction as part of my life. My goal is to live with my addiction, to live with who I am. I just don't ever want it to ruin my family again like it did. Miss hundred percent here, you're all up in this. She says it's been four or five weeks and you say it's a year. And I, I have not put a needle in my arm in over a year. I snorted heroin four weeks ago. Well, I don't know where y'all been or what you call clean and sober, but I snorting agree. heroin is right, not I what I well, call this, clean I and sober. This, or this what was, the hell? Right, I this agree. wasn't brought to my attention. Before coming here, so we have made steps. Yes. I, 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 I detox myself. Right, I'm, I'm coming to you now to put our words back together. We have been working towards ourselves and doing things. I have right. committed to my children over two months ago in trying to work with them. She, well, God bless you for that. And I'm trying to find out where the bottom is, what the real deal is. Right. And, and you've missed it 48 weeks. Yes, and I did miss it. I said eight to 10 months. <laughs> right. And Imagine my shock hearing, right. seeing, hearing this. Talk. If you think that's a shocker, I, I want to talk about Donna's own history with addiction. And I want to talk about something else that's going on in this family. I mean, is this a generational curse? And what are we doing on a day-to-day -day basis about this? We'll talk about that next. My mom thought that I could stop doing drugs, but my mother did not realize that I was way too deep in it. I never realized the addiction was so bad until she stole the $10,000 from me. During my addiction to heroin, I overdosed in a car. I was found and brought to the hospital and they injected me with Narcan. When I awoke, I called my dope man, bring me heroin to the hospital. I pulled the IV out of my arm and I injected heroin into me. And not even five minutes later, I died. 
I died twice in less than 48 hours. Well, 32-year-old Ariel has been battling a heroin addiction that stole more than a decade of her life. There is one safety net that is always there to catch her when she falls, and that's her mother, Donna. Before I realized Ariel had a full-blown addiction, I always felt she would stop. I always felt it was a fad. I was in my 20s, about the same age as Ariel when I had my addiction. My friends were doing it. We were socially experimenting and getting high. But when I was doing drugs, I could turn it off. Because Donna used drugs in the past, she was the one that took the lead role in dealing with the situation. My mom thought that I could stop doing drugs, but my mother did not realize that I was way too deep in it. I never realized the addiction was so bad until she stole the $10,000 from me. I owed my drug man about $10,000 and an opportunity came and I took the money. She's missing and the money's missing. She's missed this a long time ago. Huh, I won't stop till I get my money back. Don't steal from your parents. I initially pressed charges against Ariel and she was taken into jail. I turned myself in and my mom came and bonded me out. When I got out, I left. I went back to the streets. People may call me an enabler, but it is truly unconditional love and a mother's instinct to protect and care for her child. Are you two smoking dope together I, daily? I smoke CBD. I have a blend that I smoke for my anxiety. I don't take Xanax or any pills like that. And it's not every day. Are, are you drinking and smoking marijuana with her on a regular basis? No, sir, I am not on a regular basis. What that are you not. doing? I, am, I go out, I work, but I have my, like I said, I do CBD and I mix it with THC and that is me. That is Donna. That is not Ariel. You're not doing this with her? If she's there, yes, Absolutely. But well, to say, come on, let's go, no, it's not. That's, we well, live in the same home. Let's hear what she had to say about it. My marriage deteriorated when Ariel had come clean. Just last week, Ariel said, now I'm part of the marriage. I 100% feel like I am more married to my mother than my father. Just not the physical part, but the emotional part, I'm all there. That is my wife. I have a ring for her. After as much time as we have spent, on this journey, especially now, you know, with the sobriety and everything, I have more in common with Ariel than with Ivy. Donald Swish rose from the parent to the friend. Now they're drinking together. And when Ariel was switching from the heroin to the marijuana, they start smoking. After we get the kids off to school, so we sit outside and, and we meditate and we, we smoke and we're on our computers. And then we go back out and smoke before my son gets off the bus. And then we don't have our alone time again like that to talk until everyone else is asleep. Ariel and I are close, but I strongly feel that Ivy doesn't think he's being pushed aside. Because I'm no longer physically able to go work, I don't smoke or drink. I'm the outsider watching them two connect. Okay. Okay, yeah. That's his perspective, and he's entitled to that. He really is entitled to that. But when I look at what I'm seeing, and the way, and I'm going to be honest, with the wife and the, I'm her wife, see the ring. Yes, I have a ring. I have a commitment ring that I wear with my daughter. The saying of the, I'm her wife, I'm pretty sure that I would say itself, that's, that's more of a joke. And everyone that knows us, that's how they know us. That's, that's a joke. That's not something we look at as, oh, we go away from him and talk about him. Are y'all smoking and drinking together on a regular basis? Yes. Why is she saying yes and you're saying because no? Because I'm saying when she comes out, I don't call Ariel and say, let's go do this. We don't. We, we live in the same house. You have an addict daughter that I has do. dominated your family and you're sharing substances with her on a regular basis. Okay. True or false? I'm going to say... I'll, yes. Yeah, yes. I'll say true. Yes. yes. I'll say true. Why are you playing semantics with me about this? You're not, not an enabler. You're a co-conspirator. I'm not, I'm not a co-conspirator at all. And I refuse to have you sit there and say that I am a co-conspirator because I Well, you I don't get to choose what I say, well, so I'm you choosing, can refuse can all you want. I can choose my answer, and my answer is the truth for me. So you can do a lot of things, 
but you don't do substances with them. You don't do alcohol. You don't do marijuana. You don't do crack. You don't do coke. You don't do anything with that person if you support their sobriety. I do support her sobriety. And I support her sobriety and her anxiety being handled by the, the CBD and the C THC versus my daughter taking heroin or anything else. I see the difference. I see the difference. You don't feel like you protected them? I, uh, yes. You've hidden with bats, right? We would hide in my room with metal bats. Are you aware of that? Yes. I never knew about that. I didn't either. Thursday on an all-new Dr. Phil. I truly believe that I had the perfect marriage. Until U.S. Marshals held her at gunpoint and arrested her husband. Brittany, it's got to be disgusting to you that he's playing the victim. That's Thursday. Mother is, is doing that I don't, with you. She doesn't see it that, that way. She's seen the difference. In, I'm asking you how you see it. I don't know how I see it. I see it as she loves me. How about you, Ivy? I see it the same way. I've seen my daughter function as a mother. I'm so proud of her. I know we have a long way to go. Because here in this four weeks, that's a shocker to me. But compared to where we were, to where we are seeing her function as a mother to her son, uh, children, whatever they're doing, until we can get the, 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 the medical help that's really needed, I'm happy with that. But you say she switched roles from mother to friend. She's carried a, she's carried a heavy load. That's one of the reasons why I'm here, to support her to deal with the, the burden that she's taken on. They had to, they had to com combine, fill my role as an uh, income provider. Because, I, I mean, once I got sick, I couldn't do it. So they had to do it. And I know it's a struggle. Did you know that Michael was bullied in school? Yes, when he I was do. Being, when he was being bullied? Did you yes, know I it? do. Did you know it at the time? No, I didn't. But I do, I do now. And I knew there was another time he was bullied, but this time I missed. There was, a, there was another time. Mm -hmm. I did, caught that one, but didn't get that one. Did you one. know it? No, I didn't know it. So neither of y'all knew it? No. Did you know that he harmed himself because of it? No. Yes, I was uh, a you friend. Know, I didn't you know. didn't know? A friend of mine reached out when they saw a post he made. And you didn't talk to your parents about this at the time? No. I was scared, and I didn't want to talk to them because it was dealing with Ario. So you didn't feel like they had time for you because of being absorbed with the other stuff? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you know it now? Yes. Yes. Of course. Yes. yes. What have you done about it since you've found out about it? With well, we, Michael? We've talked, and we, we talk a lot more. The help I'm receiving from counselors at school has been Phenomenal. I can't thank them enough because they're my, my backbone. I've been able to share so much with them. And I have a couple of counselors that I can talk to. But talking to Michael has been a challenge. It's something I pray about daily. Mm -hmm. Did um, y'all feel like you protected them I, yes. at times when I, I Ariel felt was, was protected at her them. worst? I felt I protected them. Did y'all feel like there were times when you had to self-protect? Yes. I mean, you've been, you've hidden with bats, right? Yes. When people would come over and you were yes, afraid of what would happen? Um, yes. Um, when Ariel was like towards her wor the worst of her addiction, um, she would have guys over and we would hide in my room with metal bats um, to try and protect her just in case they would try to harm her. Are you aware of that? Yes. Mm -hmm. I gave them a bat one time. Have you talked to him about that? Have we talked about protecting for Ariel? No, yes. about the fact that they experienced that. Yes. I never knew about that. I didn't either. I'm just, I'm hearing it. You heard it before I heard it. So this, this all, it's all kind of came interesting out to hear, isn't it? Yeah. I had a bat. Yeah. I had a bat as well. <laughs> well, could there be a key event in Ariel's ass that plays a big part in how she ended up? We'll talk about that when we come back. Donna says Ariel has relapsed five or six times in almost 11-year struggle with heroin. 
But there are a few events in her childhood that she says could have also played a key role in her path from bulimia to pills to full-blown heroin. Starting when I was eight, I was molested several times. I know it was because I looked different than everyone else. When I was born, my mom can tell you that my father's mother, they, they, they didn't believe how I looked. They wanted to come see the way I looked. Why was I so light? Why were my eyes like that? They didn't believe I belonged to him. So my mom said that she would never let anyone touch me. I felt like she put me on a pedestal early. So when you put me around these other kids and you see how I'm treated this way, you don't think they're gonna be mean to me. They're gonna pull my hair. They're gonna touch me. I believe that that abuse affected me entirely with my self-esteem and it was the downfall to a lot of my behaviors. I just didn't feel normal. Very sorry that happened to you. And it wasn't a one-time thing. Yes, sir. This happened across time, right? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. It just came out. Doing out for, you. for, for me, you. For you. Uh, what, a day ago, two days ago? Mm-hmm. Because I kept hearing over the years, anxiety, anxiety. What's the story about the anxiety? That's when I found out. Because I would tell you, and I've told my wife, something happened. Mm-hmm. In 2016, when she was at her worst, something happened to our daughter. Nobody ever got to the bottom of it. And I just started ask, being able to ask certain questions. I found out she was raped. And uh, uh, I found that out, question. Then I just asked about the anxiety and found out about this. This was a blow. But you now know that she oh, was molested when she was eight. Yes. Yes. And, and just like know I said, that it this happened is about to deal well. By more than one person on more than one occasion. She just only mentioned one, one, one individual. I don't know the other. I don't well, I'm know telling the, you now. Yeah. I, I heard, it came out of her mouth. I, don't, I, did, I didn't know. Well, I'm telling you now that it's more than one person. I, believe, I can believe that. We've always wanted to know. I'm looking at you. We've always wanted to know what you had hidden. You just never told us. You deserve for that to be dealt with. Absolutely. We're going to take a break. Coming up, I'm going to start really putting some verbs into my sentence here and give this family some very clear ideas of where I think we need to go here and where I think we are right now. Uh, Something I've never done before. New ground. We'll be right back. Want to know what's coming up on Dr. Phil? Visit our website and subscribe to our newsletter. You'll get weekly updates, live strategies, and exclusive video that you won't find anywhere else. Plus, on drphil.com, you can see sneak previews of upcoming shows. Log on today. How do y'all think this is going so far? I feel any time that you can put us together, that we can freely cry, and admit some things that maybe haven't been said, I think we're in a good spot. Do you think y'all are um, approaching this like running forward with open arms, or do you think you're approaching it defensively? I think open arms. I do, personally. I think some of us are approaching it defensively. I I think there's a lot of defensiveness here. A lot of defensiveness. Mm -hmm. That's okay. okay. I think when you get asked hard questions and you get asked to look at hard aspects of your life, it's, it's hard not to be sure, kind of defensive about it. I, I wrote down a list of questions that I have in my mind. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I wrote them down, and I want to show you what they are. These are just things that I, I put down that just jump out at me just at first blush. Uh, What is being done on a daily basis to make sure that Ariel's two children are being insulated from all these current family dynamics? What's being put in place to ensure that these children can thrive? We've seen how Michael and Ellie have suffered through neglect. What's different now? What can be done for Michael and Ellie as they prepare to launch into their lives to get out there? Are they equipped with basic life skills to succeed? Do Ivy and Donna want to salvage their marriage? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Are they prepared to put their relationship ahead of Ariel's interest? Ariel is semi-sober. Is she ready to take her children and provide support in a healthy home? Prepared? What is she prepared to do now? Is this family to come together in a healthy way, which means they have to individuate in healthy ways? Are they ready to substitute the drama for a lot of hard work? Is Donna willing to set clear boundaries with her daughter? I mean, just uh, these jump out at me just from the very beginning. If we just answer just those questions, those are questions I had before I even met you. Mm -hmm. If we answer just those questions, you would take a quantum leap forward. And I want to do things a little differently here. We're going to take a multi-day dive into the aftermath of everything that's happened here. I want to meet with you guys again tomorrow. Okay. But I have a very specific assignment that I want you to do tonight. You know, this is an event that can be a catalyst for change. I mean, real change in your life. If you yes. seize this opportunity, you can look back 10 years from now and say, I remember the day we walked through that door and it set us on a path for change that brought us to where we are today. And that's up to you. I mean, I I hope you create value. But what I want you to do is I want you to sit down, each of you, with a pen and paper, and I want you to write two pages on the story I'll tell myself if I don't create value with this opportunity. The story I'll tell myself, because there'll be some crap you tell yourself, you'll justify it somehow, you'll make some excuse, you'll blame somebody, you'll bl- The story I'll tell myself if I don't create value. Fair enough? Fair, Fair enough. enough. Okay. And then we'll pick up. There is so much more work to be done. And we will continue this because we're going to be right back in this circle tomorrow. You feel like coming back? Absolutely. 100%. Yes. 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 Tomorrow on an all new Dr. Phil. I'm not sure that you guys are ready to change. Be specific. Oh, I've been specific. I gave you a specific assignment that you just blew off. A family back for help. Is there anything that I say to you that you're not going to argue with? I'm going to argue what I feel is right. Is there confusion about biology in this family? Is this your biological father or not? I can leave and you can finish it with them. You do whatever you want. That's tomorrow. I want to thank my guests today. For more information about today's show, log on to drphil.com. We'll be talking about this, I'm sure, tonight on Facebook. People will have opinions. Don't forget to join the uh, Dr. Phil Fanatics. It's where that happens. Super fans discuss the episodes, and you can get news that you can't get anywhere else. Uh, We'll see you next time. Take care. Every day and night, that's right Ooh, you know we gon'